Go ahead. All right. So first, thank you, Meredith, Mo, Shri, and Kimberly for giving me the chance to share with everybody in the community the work that we've been doing for now a couple of years and has suddenly become quite timely um, on coronavirus and really trying to understand uh, its entry and infection process. And um, I think what's super appropriate for this group is that we've taken a really interdisciplinary view. So I hope that um, what I'm able to do is maybe inspire some of you to think about how your toolbox could be leveraged to study this problem uh, and other viruses in the future. So I'm gonna jump right into it because of time. We already all know how important coronavirus is, but um, what we study is the entry process of this virus. And so here's a schematic that my student drew um, that sort of captures the complexity of coronavirus um, and how it, it, it's a little bit more difficult to tease out what's going on compared to, to other viruses in this family. So as you may know already, Coronavirus is a membrane enveloped virus with these spikes on it, which give rise to the name Corona. Um, and these spikes are the important um, molecular uh, proteins that are involved in facilitating this virus getting in uh, and transferring its genome into the cell. So um, the part that we study consists of two parts, uh, virus binding to the host cell and then membrane fusion, which is the part that allows the, the genome out. Um, and so this virus is interesting because it binds to the host cell. Um, we know this is ACE2 for SARS-2, for example, um, and that's denoted here by these um, blue little structures on the plasma membrane surface. Now, interestingly, coronavirus can take two different pathways into the host cell, which gives it a little extra flexibility um, and an ability to, to kind of um, be pervasive in the cells that it infects once it gets into your lungs uh, and, and move on to other tissues. So um, in the first path I'll, I'll describe is this plasma membrane pathway where it can directly fuse with the plasma membrane and transfer its genome directly into the cytosol. Um, the other pathway um, is the endo, uh, through endocytosis where it gets um, put into an endosome and then um, it needs to merge its membrane with the endosomal membrane to release that genome. And um, what really dictates as far as we understand now the, the pathway that this um, virus will take is on the conditions that are in these two sort of pathways, right? So at the plasma membrane pathway, you've got particular proteases and particular ones that are uh, membrane expressed like Tempris 2 um, that help to drive this pathway forward. If that's not available in the cell line that the, the virus um, has interacted with, then it can take this pathway in and then there are specific changes in the local environment there that let the virus know it's time to, to release the genome. And that uh, is uh, acidification, right? So the endosome gets acidified. There's proteases such as cathepsins that get activated with pH. Those start to cleave the virus, ionic uh, perturbations, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the virus sort of has this ability to take advantage of wherever it is um, to, get, to get its way forward um, in, in the infection process. So if you're interested in this, I'll just point out, we have this paper that we, um, we uh, completed uh, in April, um, also very serendipitously about coronavirus in general, a little bit um, that was known at, about SARS-2 at the time. And so the talk is going to really highlight a lot of that work now. So here's our coronavirus uh, uh, cartoon again with the spike proteins. Here's a sort of gene map. What we're really interested in is the machinery that allows entry. So that's the spike protein, which we've got drawn over here and color coded to match this part of the gene um, that has specific regions that I'm gonna talk about today. So mostly I'm gonna be focusing on this little region in pink here called the fusion peptide that's over here. Um, but we are also interested in looking at this uh, heptide repeat uh, unit. Here's one in purple and one in orange that I'll talk about at the very end if there's time um, as in strategies to, to basically disarm the virus. So as I said, spike protein is the key player that allows the, um, the genome to be transferred into the cytosol. And so we wanna really just figure out where are the chinks in the armor that we can exploit to, um, to stop that process. So if we zoom in on this fusion peptide zone here, this is the sequence. And one thing I wanna point out here is, is actually pretty good conservation across at least SARS and SARS-2, which is sort of where SARS-2 got its name, right? So if you look, all the red are common across SARS, MERS, and SARS-2. If you look at blue, those are the additional conservations between what I'll call SARS-1 and SARS-2. And then you can see a few other, you know, commonalities between MERS and SARS and MERS and SARS-2. 
Um, but what's kind of nice is there's this great conservation. And so that means that if you could develop uh, strategies to block the function of the fusion peptide, there's a good chance that that's going to be broadly applicable to many coronaviruses, right? So that's what, why we were excited and focusing in this in, in part. Um, so there are other kind of critical key features that we can exploit. For example, there's this disulfide bond run that you see is common to these three. The other thing that's kind of interesting is there's this hydrophobic stretch. So that's the part that will apparently uh, interact with the host membrane. And then what we noticed um, years ago was that there were sort of these conserved charge residues that were sort of positioned at these points for many of the coronaviruses. And we started to wonder if that was um, played a key role in some fashion. Okay, so before I get into that story, um, just a few challenges and why I think that um, the biophysics community is a great one to, to dig into this, um, is that, you know, when you wanna study a, a membrane protein, right, you wanna get the crystal structure. And then once you have the crystal structure, you can back out functionality. But for viruses uh, and virus spikes in particular, it's pretty complicated because they undergo this really hugely transformative uh, con conformational change during this. And that also um, exposes a lot of hydrophobic residues, right? Because it needs to interact with the hydrophobic portions of the host membrane. So getting crystal structures post-fusion is difficult, right? So the, the few that we have, this is um, the structure that, that's built on, on one of the crystallized um, coronavirus structures. And then with the pieces that are um, appropriate for MERS, uh, SARS and SARS-2 kind of superimposed in, in blue and um, green and red here, and you can see that by sort of modeling it this way, we can figure out where the fusion peptides are sitting, but uh, it's still kind of a guess, right? Because we don't know, you know, at the post uh, side of things, what this is going to look like, and it's often pretty unresolved. So you can see, you know, some loopy, uh, disordered regions of this fusion peptide. So we need to turn to other tools to be able to understand how this thing works and, and what, you know, what, again, chinks in the armor there are to block and disarm it. So that's where interdisciplinary comes in, right? So really this work is, is, a, is a huge effort, not just of my lab, but many labs where we bring virologists, cell biologists, immunologists, now clinical folks, both in the vet world as well as human world, chemistry, biochemistry, engineering, biophysics all come together and like to kind of build this picture of our work as sort of this triad, right? Where we're trying to look at structural and functional um, interactions of this, of this protein, but really how that all translate up to biological outcomes, right? And then feeding what we know from biological outcomes back down to try to understand ultimately how we can, we can stop this virus's uh, infection progression. So we got really interested in uh, the role of calcium in, in uh, virus infection um, and for a number of reasons. Um, calcium is well known to be a, a facilitator for, for, general or for general membrane fusion, right? So already at that point, we're thinking, well, okay, probably has a special role in virus fusion as well. But then when you look at more coronaviruses, so now here's several more, you can really start to appreciate that conservation, right? So here's ED all the way down, conserved, all the Ds all the same, D over here, all the same, right? You've got that hydrophobic residue, all the same. You've got these um, disulfide bond, the uh, disulfide, these groups, cysteines that'll make a disulfide bond all in the same position. And if we look over here at what we know of how this fusion peptide might, might be sort of arranged, you can see there, there's a disulfide bond there. And then you see the hydrophobic portion here. And then if you look, right, these um, uh, charge residues are all sort of coming together and forming what looks like a pocket where, bam, a, a calcium ion could sit and kind of stabilize this loop so that it can harpoon into the host cell, right? So, um, we were not the first to think about this in terms of um, virus uh, uh, entry. Um, the Keelian lab was really um, the first ones who really looked in the context of rubella at the role of these sort of ion bridges. Um, and in that particular uh, fusion um, machinery, it's called E1, you can see that they've resolved that it sits in here. Um, and then this is just another quick um, piece of data there where they show the relative infectivity of a virus that's not calcium sensitive called SFV and then the rubella and you could see as they increase the concentration of calcium infection increased. So we, we were inspired by that. We were also uh, at the time we had an Ebola outbreak and so we began studies on understanding 
Ebola virus, and we also so, saw the same kind of pattern, right? So here you can see the sequence, and you can see uh, on the fusion machinery of that, that the, again, a, a calcium ion can sit right in there, and we were able to show that, you know, infection uh, increased when you had calcium present, that, you know, many other factors um, that I'll talk about in the context of, of SARS were also um, occurring in, in this Ebola machinery. So you might be wondering, you know, okay, well, calcium, how is calcium kind of overlaying this process and in the cell and whatnot? So the, the measurement of calcium inside cells is, is not uh, an easy thing to do, but what we know from, from these papers and, and many others is that, um, you know, you've got calcium on the outside of the cell, and then once something gets endocytosed, like a virus, right, there's a rapid drop in calcium, but then it starts to increase over time as um, you know, the endosome matures and it um, starts to combine with calcium stores inside the, the cell. And so there is kind of a, a reason to believe that uh, the way that this thing may be timing, that calcium could be arriving at the scene just in time when the fusion machinery needs to grab onto that and stabilize itself so it can carry on with the fusion reaction. Okay, so the first thing we did was uh, just a simple infectivity um, assay. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end about how we make these virus-like particles, but let's suffice it to say at this point, we have this reporter virus-like particle that has a gene inside of it that turns the cell green when the infection has proceeded. And the outside of the particle is decorated with the, the spike protein of interest, right? And so we were able to, um, to do this sort of cell culture-based assay with these virus-like particles where we could test whether or not calcium made a difference. So again, here is a, a virus that we know is not um, calcium sensitive, where whether there's calcium present or not, you can see this relative luciferase unit is, is basically a measure of, of the um, infectivity. You could see pretty much even, right? When we swapped out the, the spike here from VSV, which is called G for SARS, SARS-1 spike S, um, you can see that when we chelated the local sort of calcium in the dish, if you will, um, that we got a reduction in, um, in infection. But what's really pretty striking was when we used this compound called BAPTA-AM, which is an internal calcium chelator inside the cell, boom, you get a really big drop, right? So that was really kind of exciting at the time because we thought, ah, you know, maybe we're onto something, maybe there's a theme here. Um, and you could see that, you know, cell viability wasn't impacted by this drug. So, so it wasn't a, a case of just the cells being sick or something. So that really, you know, got us going into thinking about, okay, how, how is this really, what's happening here? So let me take you now through um, the function side of things, right? So here is, again, this cartoon of the spike protein sitting in the viral membrane. And um, again, that's this little uh, ribbon diagram that we showed here. And the fusion peptide is, is an important player. You can't see it here because it's kind of tucked inside. Remember, this is going to sort of undergo this really giant conformational change to drive this process forward. Um, and what we know is that um, you have sort of this pre-fusion native state, right? And they get the, the, the virus, the, the protein gets, um, undergoes something called priming. What priming really refers to is a protease cleavage that comes in and clips a little section of this um, uh, spike protein. And, and you could maybe think about it as kind of loosening up the structure, right? And so that loosening up of the structure is kind of a, a message to the virus, okay, we're starting to move down that pathway. Um, and so, then comes the trigger. So in the case of coronavirus, um, again, depending on the pathway, it seems to be uh, protease and, and pH that are important in that triggering process. But as I'm going to show you uh, again in the next future slides, there's also the role of, of ions and other um, local chemical signals there too. So when this trigger happens, the, what happens is the fusion peptide, which is tucked in here, kind of harpoons itself into the host cell, right? So it's bound to the receptor, but now we're talking about the part of the protein that actually starts to facilitate this membrane merging. So you can see they're kind of stuck here in there, and that's where that hydrophobic part's important because it needs to kind of anchor in there, right? And then the, the conformational change of this protein needs to facilitate, basically bring these two guys together um, so that we can get a hold of form essentially, right? So here we are at this thing called a, a pre-hairpin intermediate. This then undergoes this folding where the, these two heptad repeats that I described very briefly in the beginning start to come back together. They have affinity for each other and they start to fold as they bring 
themselves together, right? The upper leaflets of, of both of the opposing membranes start to come together and merge. And you get this sort of thing that's referred to as a hemifusion event happening. So you've got this neck now between these two compartments, but no transfer yet. And then at some point, you get the rupture of this neck, this form of this pore, and that's when the genome can kind of send itself out of the virus uh, capsule into the cytosol, right? So, um, so our lab has been interested in trying to figure out ways to really study that process and to have a good handle on, um, you know, what are the, the specific, I guess, decoupling the conditions, right? That's, that's the tough part here, because, you know, if you try to do that inside an endosome in a cell, you know, you, you can mess up lots of other processes. So we sort of a long time ago turned to trying to, to use an in vitro approach. And so yes, fully acknowledge this is not exactly what's going on inside the cell, but the nice part of it is we have an, the ability to be able to control exactly when the pH changes, exactly when calcium is there, when protease is right, and so on and so forth. So we use this uh, platform called a supported lipid bilayer here, where we, we have a, a bilayer kind of absorbed to a glass. We can embed in that bilayer, the receptors that the virus will bind to, and all of that's inside a microfluidic device so that we can flow in different kinds of, of um, buffer conditions, right? And so we label these viruses with uh, fluorophores that allow us to read out what's going on. So in this cartoon here, you can see I have the membrane labeled in green and the internal contents labeled in red. And what we do is we watch this on our microscope. So let me play this movie for you. And you can see these little firework bursts happening. Um, each one of those little bursts represents a, a virus that is uh, fusing. In this case, we're, we're looking in the green channel, so the hemifusion event where the membrane envelope of the virus is now merging with the supported bilayer. And so what we can do based on this labeling scheme is get you know, time measurements, if you will, for these different processes and try to quantify this in a way that would allow us to you know, say, okay, well, if I tweak an amino acid in the spike protein, you know, how does that maybe change the way that this fusion process happens? So we look at this thing in the following way. We, we call the sort of pre-fusion state of the protein A, so you might think about that as reactant A, um, that undergoes some, um, you know, time lag to get to this intermediate state called hemifusion H, um, where multiple proteins may have to work together to get there to form this intermediate of this reaction, if you will. And then from this intermediate, short-lived uh, intermediate, right, we get a pore forming, the product, if you will, where the, the, the um, genome can get transferred out. So we can look at all these little individual events happening and we can kind of sum them up in, in a sense, right? And, and write a kinetic scheme and a mathematical equation that allows us to get these kinetic rate parameters. And so we can measure, for example, hemifusion rates, and we can measure the rates at which uh, pores form. And so this gives us a little quantitative handle on this. So um, we looked at this um, in the context of feline coronavirus back in 2013. Um, and this is just a bit of data to show um, the difference between um, uh, coronavirus and another common virus in this family, which is influenza. So also an enveloped um, uh, particle with a spike protein called hemagglutinin. You can see here, just really quickly to highlight this, the, the hemifusion rate constant uh, flu is much more pH dependent than uh, coronavirus in this case. Um, and so that's, that's maybe, you know, at the time it was a little surprising, but not so un un unexpected now. We know that protons are directly interacting with the hemagglutinin, but in the case of coronavirus, back to this picture, right, we know that coronavirus can fuse at pH 7. And so it's more perhaps an indirect route where the, um, the protons are interacting with the cathepsins, which are then promoting the cleavage that triggers the, the, um, the release of the genome. But, it, but it's not completely that, right? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more here in a few minutes about that. So, okay, now we fast forward to about 2016. And at this time, people were still confused about what was the fusion peptide, right? And so at the time, people were thinking it was just a little piece with this hydrophobic portion. Um, but we, again, were really looking at a wider view and we kind of thought that no, maybe it includes this, this bigger region here. Um, and so we started studying that um, in, with, uh, in collaboration with some chemists here at Cornell um, who are experts in something called electron, electron spin resonance spectroscopy. And this is a really cool technique because it tells you something about how the peptide's burying itself in the membrane and disturbing it. 
So what you have is a, a lipid vesicle where you have these spin labels at different positions in these lipids that are doped in. And you can basically look at the disturbance pattern of these to get some information about how this peptide is interacting with the membrane. So lots of data here. I'm going to try to give you just the main highlights, but we tested, you know, this supposed FP1 region of the fusion peptide and then FP2 to try to sort out really what it was. And this technique really clarified that for us. And so we were able to look at both the presence of calcium, the presence of protons around to see how this um, so-called order parameter changed as we increased the peptide lipid ratio. And so what you can take away from this, right, so going across here is sort of the top of the head group region, the upper tail, I'll call it, and then the lower tail. And as you see, you know, if there's a positive interaction, right, you're going to see sort of things go like, you know, creep up as you increase the amount of peptide. And that's indeed what we see for specific conditions being calcium presence. And if you look between red and black here, you see that the presence of low, lower pH seems to even give it a little extra boost. So you can see that um, we can see the, the peptide interacting with the upper head, uh, the upper tail, not so much in the lower tail. And then the fusion peptide, the second piece, we see sort of the similar thing. Um, over here, just really quickly, right, shows the importance of that disulfide bond. If we get rid of it with DTT, flatline, nothing, right? So that's cr clearly a very important structural element too. So now we pr put them together because of this paper was really about trying to resolve what this was. And, you know, the take home point here is that the combined FP1 and 2, right, really gives the most disturbance. And in fact, two of them together work synergistically even to disturb the lipids all the way down into the lower tail section. So what that really told us was that calcium ions whoops, and protons really were important in that fusion peptide interaction with the membrane. But we still want to get some more insight into what the structural you know, differences are. And so again, it's tough to do this, but we, we looked with uh, circular dichroism to try to get some, some uh, insight here. So really quickly, right, alpha helix kind of has this shape a beta sheet does this, and then the random coil looks like this. So if you look at FP1 in solution, it's very much like a random coil, no structure at all. When you throw in single unilamellar vesicles, you start to see, boom, that interaction at low pH is leading to some kind of alpha helical character. That makes sense, right? Because this thing wants to insert. And same thing with FP2, right? We see, again, when when the um, vesicles are present, you get more alpha helical character. And if you destroy that disulfide bond again, boom, no matter if you have low pH or, or ions, it doesn't seem to be able to recover from this random structure. So that really was important. Uh, Susan, quick okay. reminder, about three minutes left. Okay, great. So um, we then confirmed that calcium really does interact with it using isothermal calorimetry. This allows us to get um, a binding affinity quickly. We can see that the molar ratio is two for this. And so we went in, we mutated this out. We figured if we mutated that out, that we would lose the ability for calcium to bind, boom, infection dropped. So that all seemed to be lining up. So since then, we, my students have been working on looking at all these little residues and changing them out. Okay, so now we have this picture where something like this is happening uh, post-fusion trigger, right? We got this harpooned hydrophobic part in here. We've got these ion bridges that are sort of stabilizing the structure. Okay, and so now we want to try to learn a little bit more. Okay, so I have two minutes to tell you about, you know, some cool stuff that we've just done. So basically, because of the similarity between SARS-2 and SARS-1, we figured that if there is calcium sensitivity in SARS-1, maybe there is in SARS-2. And so can we now use calcium blocking drugs to limit infection? So we have two different strategies. I'm not going to have time to talk about antibodies, but I'm going to talk about calcium modulating drugs. We picked six different ones that are calcium or that are FDA approved, already in use for uh, cardiac conditions and tested them in cell culture. And two, two cell lines, Vero, which is a kidney cell line, and Calu3, which is a good uh, lung model. And let me just quickly tell you, you know, what's happening here. So we have infectivity up here. We have cytotoxicity. So what we want is low infectivity and high on the cytotoxicity, meaning the cells are, are living. And these are the conditions that we found for the kidney cells, right? So this is orange because it's a little iffy here, but these two concentrations for these two drugs seem to be okay. And then we did uh, the remaining three and we had one here that seemed to be, you know, moderately okay. Calu3, now the lung cells, we have some nice hits here that really aren't um, in the re regime of, of being too cytotoxic. 
Um, and then these drugs, there was really no hits for the, for the lung cells. Um, and so we wanted to wrap this around and say, okay, well, can we show that this is in fact entry? So here's this vi virus packaging process. I'm gonna skip it. We can answer this at the end if you want, but basically using the same strategy of whether the cells turn green or not, we could test that. And what we could see is that when we put these drugs in the cell culture, that they all, you know, there's one round of infection and you can see, you know, clearly back at those same points that the um, amount of infection drops for this one cycle of infection. And so it does seem to point to um, the entry point being one point that is um, hindered. And, and here's the lung cells as well. So, um, so certainly that doesn't rule out that calcium's not doing something on the exit part of the, the strategy. We haven't talked about any of that. Um, but certainly it seems like the entry point, which you know, all of those basic science studies fed into showed us that this was the, um, the, a, a potential um, target. So what's next? We're looking now at um, Susan, Susan, we're at time. So it seems like you're wrapping up, but go ahead and do that. Yep. So this is where we're headed next. We're going to look at patient data to see if we can correlate anything, try to do some animal studies, and of course, dig into some mechanistic studies. So let me just end with the most important thing, and that's acknowledging uh, all the, the, the funding agencies and all of the team that's worked on this and, and all of you for your attention. I'm sorry I ran a minute over, but happy to take a question or two. Okay, okay great. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm going to go a little bit out of order in the questions because we have um, an, an unusual one that comes from uh, one of our participants, four-year-old, who really is interested in coronavirus. And oh. so our, our four-year-old questioner is curious about how coronavirus affects mitochondria. And there's a note from the parent here that this might not be remotely related to your research, but, uh, but, but yeah, anyway, we're going to start with kids. Uh, you really put me on the spot there. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's not um, what I've ever looked at. I bet there could be something there, right? So mitochondria are the, the energy center of the cell, right? Um, and so if the virus um, is, is using up some of that energy to make, you know, have the cell make more of it, then perhaps there, there is a connection there. But I, I don't really have a better answer than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry, four-year-old. All right. Um, so, so Rudra Biswas asked about um, sort of calcium bridges and uh, are there sort of non-viral contexts in which something similar happens or is it sort of specific to viral infection? Um, no, I mean, I, I bet that it is a pretty general um, motif that you see, right, um, in, in, in potentially other fusion machinery. So, you know, we know calcium, for example, is important in snare um, mediated um, fusion for synaptic vesicles and things, right? And so it, it'd be interesting to, to look through and see if calcium might be directly interacting with some of that machinery. I mean, maybe some people on this call uh, are studying that and would be able to answer that better than I could, but I, I would imagine that you're going to see that, you know, this is a pretty common thing that um, is out there. So, yeah. Right. And, and Sri Arabiswas has, has the same question about the sort of membrane fusion and rupture process are there does that happen sort of outside of viral infection and in other contexts in the cell yeah i mean definitely right like so so again synaptic vesicles is, is one that you could point to but you know there's all kinds of uh merging processes happening inside your cell as as vesicles are moving you know through the golgi apparatus and the er and whatnot um so yeah i mean i think um you know, there's only so many ways to merge things together, membranes together. And so I think that it's not surprising that viruses use sort of the same things that the cell uses for very perfectly normal functions, right? Um, so uh, Faris Marian asked about in those supported lipid bilayer experiments that you were doing, what type of bilayer did you use? And are there sort of, I guess I'll add on to that, are there sort of particular lipids that work better for entry versus others? Yeah, so this is exactly why we love this assay because we can tweak those sorts of things. Um, at the time, um, what we were stuck against was the, the receptor for coronavirus is a protein, right? So when we initially sort of pioneered some of those techniques, um, we were studying flu, which has a lipid receptor or can, right, sialic acid. So it's really easy to integrate them in with the supported bilayers, but when you get to proteinaceous ones, it's hard to integrate a protein into a supported bilayer. So my team figured out that they could take blebs 
from, uh, from host cells, right? So you chemically induce little, vir uh, little uh, vesicles to come off and you, you can kind of induce them to fuse into these flat planar sheets. And that allowed us to get the um, protein, and in that case, it was aminopeptidase N, into the platform. And that was really what was pioneering about that particular work in 2013, that we could you know, extend this now to viruses that have proteinaceous receptors. So yeah, so that's, um, that's one of the great advantages of doing it in sort of that in vitro way, if that's the right word, um, that you can control all those things and, and knock things out and upregulate, you know, other things. So yeah, good question. Um, okay, so there's a bunch more questions, but I think we'll do one more brief one and then save some for the informal discussion. Um, Eric Dufresne asks about if this, your freestanding bilayer experiment could also be done, sorry, your, your supported bilayer experiment could also be done in a freestanding bilayer, like a vesicle. Um, and do you think that would impact the fusion process? No, in fact, um, there are groups that have done this. So um, some really cool experiments from a couple of years ago, I remember um, in a microfluidic where you kind of flow a virus in one side um, and it's from, from Ben Oijen's group, uh, he's in Australia now, and then um, the vesicle, they come together and you could watch the merging and you could get sort of these flashes. And so you could do rapid sort of counting, if you will, of events that, that happen. So I always thought that was really super clever. Um, and then you have a package at the end that's captured the, the genome inside of it too, if you wanted to send that off somewhere and, and study what's going on. So hopefully they're, they're continuing that because I think that could be really powerful for this uh, day and age and, and, and the kinds of genetic tools that we have available to us. So yeah, 